So hi everyone, welcome to this video. The question is, what do I wish I had known right at the beginning of our property investing journey? Now, if you are very observant, you'll notice in the title, this is in fact part two. If you haven't seen the previous video, see the iCard on screen now, click on it, because that really does give the context for the thing, the mistakes we made, and which in this video, we then hope to share with you the things that we wish we had known to mitigate those mistakes. I must also say right at the very beginning, a very warm welcome to those who have recently subscribed. We don't know who you are, but a very warm welcome. We do hope this channel will be interesting and helpful. And on that note, in, in the spirit of trying to be as helpful as possible, please do feel free to get in touch and share your comments and questions in the section below. We do read all of them and we do get back to them. So there are five things I'd like to share with you now. The five things we think we wish we had known right at the beginning, which would have perhaps most likely meant we wouldn't have made the mistakes we mentioned in the previous video. First one, I wish I had known how to speak to estate agents. And I say speak to them because I really think working with estate agents is a matter of communication and it is about working with them and cooperating with them rather than seeing them as the obstacle to the property. And let me give an example. Right early on, again, in the previous video, we mentioned how we went after the course, we went and booked in a load of viewings and put in a load of offers. And what we did is we went into the estate agent offices. And I do recommend doing that, by the way, but perhaps not in the way we did it at the beginning. And uh, me and the person we had assigned to team, team up with went in and sat at those chairs and we had a list and we said to the lady, we'd like to view all these properties, please, or these types of properties. We'd like your best deals. We're, we're looking for below market value properties. Uh, we are property investors. Um, that was, we felt the best term to share because saying anything else was going to be a bit unhelpful. You know, saying we're friends sounds a bit ridiculous. So that's what we came up with. We then went and did a load of viewings and we actually went back into the offices to give our feedback and to submit our offers. And you can imagine sort of how this went down. We've just seen a, I'll give you one, give one example. We've just seen a house was on the market for £70,000. Yes, it needed a lot of work. And here we are now sat in the estate agent offices and we said, we'd like to make an offer of £35,000 because that's 50 cent below market value, right? And if you haven't seen my previous video about what, my take on that now, then feel free to click the iCard on screen. Uh, we were actually laughed at, sniggered at, um, and rightly so, and all it really did was just left a very distasteful um, atmosphere for all concerned. It was very awkward after that, and I haven't actually been and worked with them before, since. Uh, fortunately, it's in an area that we don't actually invest in. Uh, but there we are. You know, If I'd only known how to communicate with the estate agents, it would have been arguably a whole, a whole lot better. And uh, you could say we've improved upon that now because there are three estate agents in our investment area that we have now purchased with multiple times. So I guess we're probably doing something a little bit better. The other thing I wish I had known is how to inspect a property. And I wish I had known about some of the tools that I should have been using while carrying out an inspection and not a viewing. And let me explain a little bit more about what I mean by inspection, because I have mentioned this in a previous video. When I go in, go into a viewing, what I do is I make sure I open everything that I can open. And of course, I close it again and I turn off everything, everything. And also make sure I turn off again that should be operated. So by that, I open every single door, every single cupboard, every single drawer, every single window, every single tap. And I'm making sure that the things function as they should. Or I've had, I've gone into viewings where I've opened a kitchen cupboard door and it's just fallen off my hands because it was just literally placed against, it was placed against the, uh, the, the cabinet and it wasn't actually a functional door at all. I can give you all sorts of stories, but you get the picture. Try and operate and make sure everything works as it should. You'll find taps that are completely seized that don't turn on at all. You'll find windows that are shut. And I don't just mean locked shut, but they actually, they can't be opened. So you want to make sure that everything that should be operated or manipulated is able to be so. Because if it's not, it's going to need to be rectified and that's going to have a cost associated with it. And therefore you need to make sure that is factored into your offer so that you can make a profitable transaction and have a profitable deal. And this brings me on to the, the, the matter of tools. Because one thing you also want to be looking at on your inspection is definitely the loft space. 
And for that, you're going to need a set of step ladders, most likely, and you're also going to need a torch. And I would recommend a torch and not just your light on your phone, because it's probably not going to be bright enough. Even if you've got a really the latest model, it's probably not going to be bright enough. So you're going to need a selection of tools. And as well as the torch and as well as the step ladder, I'd also recommend a damp meter reader. So you can check if you've got, if you suspect there's damp in the lower floors, you can, you can take a meter reading and you can re record that. Uh, and also you want to take with you a tape measure or a laser measurer to get the measurements for the rooms. Now, often you might get um, planning plans drawn on the advert on right move on Zoopla, the floor plan. Um, and sometimes they will have measurements, but I'd already recommend doing your own. And this brings us on to the next thing, the cost of the refurbishment. I wish I had known how to calculate the cost of a refurbishment. And the measurements of those rooms are critical in terms of calculating the costs. Now, what the real breakthrough came for us when we came across the idea of having a rates card, which is essentially for us an Excel document and we've got every single repair or um, renovation work listed out and we've got the cost for every single item. So for instance, to ease and adjust an internal door, there'll be a cost. To plaster one wall, there'll be a cost. To lay turf in a garden, there'll be a cost. To replace the architrave or to replace the skirting board in a room, that's a line item, there'll be a cost. To replace an, an, an external door lock, there'll be a cost. Do you get the idea? Everything will have a cost. Gas safety check, electrical safety check. And once you have this rates card, which by the way, you do want to make sure you revise and revisit once a quarter to make, because obviously prices of things go up and down, particularly now at the moment. But once you have a rates card, it's gonna be much more helpful for you to give a picture of how to cost the refurbishment. And I wish I'd had that right back at the beginning. And if you need a bit of help, always get in touch with a quantity surveyor. They are the people that will do this professionally. Um, and if you just use one or two on the first, first, um, first two, one or two projects, you can then kind of imitate what they do when you buy project number three, four, five, six, and so on. I also wish I'd known how to produce a schedule of works, which is basically the list, which is going to form part of the contract for what the builder or your main contractor is going to do on the refurbishment. So it's how to produce a schedule of works, line item by line item by line item, very clear, very specific, and you might have with it a specification. So if he says, um, replace the internal door, the specification will tell you what type of door you're expecting to replace, but you definitely need a schedule of works. It keeps everyone on top of what should be happening, you and the builder, and it's a two-way thing. Again, communication is really key. Also with that, make sure you have things like you check their um, uh, insurance and you check their start date and you check the cost of materials and you check who's going to be supplying them. You check the cost of labour and how long a thing is going to take and what the end date is going to be like and how you produce. Essentially, it's a contract between you and your builder or you and your main contractor. And I wish I had known how to do that right at the beginning. And this brings us on to the final point. I wish I'd known how to do my due diligence. And by that, I mean, you really need to check out who these people are that you're hoping to do uh, to have a business relationship with. So you need to make sure you check your builder, for instance. You need to make sure they have public liability insurance. If you're going to work with an electrician, make sure you check that they are Part P qualified. If you're going to work with a plumber you need to, and they're going to do work on the boiler, you need to make sure they are gas safe registered and they should have a registration number, which you can check online. If you're going to work with a solicitor, if you're going to work with a mortgage broker, make sure they've got all their appropriate credentials. And if you need to see their insurance or their certificates, ask. It's part of checking they are who they say they are. Because here's the thing. If we had checked that our builder mentioned in our previous video, if we had checked on Company's House, we would have found that he was being forced to close his company down because he'd done exactly the same thing to people in the past. And if we just checked that, we wouldn't have worked with him and we wouldn't have landed ourselves in a mess that took us 18 months to sort out. So that's the final thing. I wish I'd learned how to do our due diligence. Now, I must have said at the end, I have received a whole list of questions this week 
uh, relating to the buy, refurbish, rent, refinance model. Thank you ever so much, Joe, for sending those over. Amazing questions, and I hope to be answering those in the coming weeks as I, as I produce more videos. That said, again, I've got new subscribers here. A very warm welcome to you. Please feel free to be part of this and, and, and participate. If you've got questions or comments, we really appreciate those who share comments with us. We really, really do. It gives us the feedback. Also, if you liked it, please give us a like. And if you disliked it, tell us, give us, a, give us a thumbs down because that tells us, again, it's feedback. We really appreciate that. Thank you ever so much for your support. As always, I know I keep saying it, but we do really, really appreciate your support. So thank you for that. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. We look forward to seeing you in the next one.